Good morning. Uh, my name is Rob McCullough. I'm the division head in cardiology. Um, I'd just like to introduce uh, Jack Murray. Um, his better half, Nadine, is not here this morning. Um, uh, we have uh, two main lectures every year, and Jack and Nadine have been kind enough to sponsor a visiting professorship. Both Jack and Nadine have long ties to the university. Jack graduated from his fellowship here. I'm going to say 58, but I don't know if you're okay with that. Um, he was a faculty member here, both he practiced here, Harborview at the, the VA. He, um, uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, Bob Bruce, uh, the chair that I hold, was the chief of cardiology uh, back uh, then, and he's had ongoing ties with the division, and, and as I said, based on his own experience as a visiting professor, has sponsored this wonderful opportunity for us to bring in leaders in cardiovascular medicine. It's, um, we have a special honor in um, uh, this year hosting uh, Michael Parmasek, who is uh, very recently the chair of medicine now at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, Jack wanted to say a few words because there is a connection with the chair that uh, Michael holds. Uh, the committee uh, very nicely invited Dr. Parmacek this year, which happens to be the 50th anniversary of my time at the University of Pennsylvania. While I was there, uh, this uh, photograph was taken. Uh, I shown it to Michael, and I said, "Where is it? And do you recognize two faces?" Well, he got. Where it was, it's on the entrance to the Maloney Building at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the professor of medicine for which his chair is named is on uh, the far side. Uh, that's Dr. Wood. And uh, you probably know his son, Francis, uh, as well. Uh, the other person in the uh, uh, picture that you probably don't recognize is right there. And that was uh, yours truly with hair. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's 50 years ago. Um, all of you contemporary house staff will appreciate the white coats, which were provided and laundered uh, by the hospital. You'll notice it's uh, entirely a male cadre. And this is two years of residence at the University of Pennsylvania seven in each year. So things have changed. Michael, uh, welcome to the University of Washington, and we're going to be very interested about the next 50 years. <laughs> Thank you. OK, well, it really is a pleasure. Um, and uh, these connections to Penn, um, I was honored to uh, uh, be named the Murray Lecturer this year, um, but I really didn't know the connection uh, to Fran Wood and that Dr. Murray trained at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm struck that we have about uh, three times more cardiology fellows now than they had medicine residents training um, in those days, and it sort of reflects um, uh, this, this title is strangely appropriate uh, given what that 50 years to this 50 years looks like, and we're going to project a little bit into the next 50 years. Uh, but I decided I would go um, a little bit old school here and actually start off with a case presentation like we used to do in Medicine Grand Rounds many, many years ago. And I'm highlighting this is an actual case I still attend in the CCU. Uh, about four weeks a year, and this is from a year or two ago when I was the attending physician, and it really highlights the type of cases uh, that we see nowadays in the CCU, which are very, very, very different than the type I saw even when I was training 30 years ago. Uh, and it's going to be those differences that I'll highlight in my talk today. But let me start off with this case because, again, I think we can learn from everything. This is a patient. Uh, it's a 43-year-old female. Uh, who was born with Tetralogy of Fallot and had surgery at age five to repair uh, the Tetralogy and had required a repeat procedure at age 12. Uh, she presented to the HUP uh, CCU from an outside hospital with a chief complaint of hypoxia or shortness of breath. 
Um, she stated that since 20, uh, December 2010, she had been short of breath with increasing swelling of her lower extremities and uh, had become cyanotic. Um, she was not being followed, despite the history of congenital heart disease, by a cardiologist prior to this admission, which is remarkably common and something I'll touch on uh, in patients with congenital heart disease. She also stated that she had become increasingly weak and sleepy with episodic dizziness. She said in the two weeks prior to admission that she had gained 10 pounds and had increasing episodic palpitations. At uh, one of our local community hospitals, she was diagnosed with heart failure. Chest x-ray at that hospital uh, showed uh, a severe congestion with a BNP uh, of 9,500. Uh, telemetry revealed uh, paroxysmal atrial uh, fibrillation uh, versus SVT, at least that's what their chart said. And she was started on uh, oxygen and a diltiazin drip for the SVT. However, she didn't improve, and she was transferred from uh, Joe Biden's hometown of Scranton, Pennsylvania, to the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, after she was started on Lasix, Diamox, a beta blocker, and an ACE inhibitor, uh, though she continued to deteriorate at the outside hospital. Um, upon presentation in the CCU, her blood pressure on pressors uh, was 90 over 50, her pulse was 130, respiratory rate 25, she was on uh, oxygen mask at that time, and her uh, temperature was uh, 99. Uh, she was notably short with a very unusual face, uh, she was markedly cyanotic and in clear respiratory distress. Uh, inspection of her neck revealed uh, cannon V waves. Her carotid pulses were palpable, but she had JVD to the angle of the jaw. There was no brewery. Uh, she had a marked uh, right ventricular heave, an S1 with a 3 over 6 holosystolic murmur heard throughout the precordium, an S2, and a 1 over 6 diastolic blow along the lower left sternal border. This highlights the fact that we still do uh, auscultation with stethoscopes at Penn, though as you will see, we quickly got an echocardiogram to confirm our findings. Uh, I should point out, though, one of the masters of physical exam, I hadn't meant to say this, was Fran Wood. Um, and Fran was legendary at Penn. Uh, he was an old school cardiologist for his uh, physical exam. And uh, again, it's an interesting tie today to see Fran Jr. here with us. Um, lungs were noted to be uh, dullness at the bases uh, with dullness to percussion. Rouse at the bases, I'm sorry. She was uh, breathing very shallow. Her breathing was shallow. Uh, she had decreased bowel sounds, abdomen was soft and non-tender, pulse at the liver, and her extremities revealed uh, two to three pretibial edema bilaterally. This was her EKG. Um, as you can see, uh, by a very quick inspection, uh, she had an ectopic atrial rhythm, uh, right bundle branch block, a left posterior fascicular block. Um, probably the inferior infarct is not, is, is an artifact, uh, and uh, in any case, uh, she was tachycardic. Although then, this is her echocardiogram. It should hopefully keep winding, I hope, yep. And what you'll see here, although it doesn't project as well as I'd like it to project, is that her LV thickness was a little, her LV was a little bit thick, her ejection fraction, LV ejection fraction was 45%. Her, um, let's see if I can point this out to you. Her right atria, which is here, um, is markedly enlarged and dilated with mar moderate right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, you can see when the right ventricle is bigger than the left ventricle and you have bulging of the septum, that's not good. Um, clearly consistent with RV pressure overload. She had severe, um, which we're not showing here, pulmonic regurgitation. The tricuspid valve leaflets failed to coapt uh, due to annular dilatation, which is fairly obvious. She had moderate to severe TR. Her pulmonary artery systolic pressure was 87. She had severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and there was a continuous right to left shunt by color Doppler showed consistent with uh, ASD. The, old, uh, the left ventricle opacified with contrast injections, again consistent with a right to left, stress right to left shunt. Um, she went on to have a CT angio, which revealed again a decrease in, in the interatrial septum, measuring one centimeter in diameter uh, in the region of the foramen or valley. There was greater than one centimeter uh, soft tissue mantle circumferentially, which was attributed to her earlier surgery. 
there was um, diffuse multifocal narrowing of the right main pulmonary artery and angulation and narrowing of the proximal left pulmonary artery, and she had globally depressed uh, at the time of CT angio, angio LV, and RV function. Uh, cath was performed, uh, no coronary disease, anomalous origin of the left atrial, uh, left anterior descending from the RCA orifice. Cardiac output was a bit low with an index of 2.3. Uh, pressures at the time were most notable for pulmonary hypertension with a PA pressure of 106 over 55. PA sat was 31 percent. Uh, again, all consistent with severe pulmonary hypertension with a uh, right to left shunt. Um, and again, there, the uh, cast showed inferior ASD with a bidirectional flow and severe TR and MR. Well, this was what we faced when I showed up on morning rounds in the CCU. I'd like to say this is unusual, but this is increasingly common. Uh, like uh, I understand at uh, University of Washington, we have a growing adult congenital heart disease program. These patients were not patients I saw when I was training because they didn't survive when I was training uh, 30 years ago, by and large. I'll show you a few statistics on that. Uh, but suffice it to say, and I won't uh, go into too much detail for this uh, case, I just want to present it as emblematic of what we see these days in the CCU versus the old uh, tried and true myocardial infarction. Um, the patient was, uh, we called for a pulmonary hypertension consult. Uh, the pulmonary hypertension, this is the new world of cardiology, uh, suggested sildenafil um, and Flolan. Um, we treated her AVNRT, our cardiac electrophysiologist uh, did. This was uh, unlike everyone else that shows up with AVNRT at Penn who undergo ablation. She was actually treated with PRN adenosine um, and uh, she was started on metoprolol, uh, which is highly unusual for our EP service, which is very aggressive with their, uh, with their uh, ablation therapies. We do about 4,000 of those a year now. Um, and in any case, she improved remarkably. And again, I present this case because this is what we now see in our CCU increasingly, uh, which is very, very different. When I trained, if we uh, were trained for 15 minutes, well, we probably had a few lectures on congenital heart disease and cardiac development, but it certainly wasn't the focus of adult cardiology training, and for that reason, we've added mandatory um, a two-month rotation in congenital heart disease in our training program. This is what I grew up with. Um, you probably don't remember this era, at least the trainees don't, uh, so I have to revert back to Mad Men, the TV show, to show you what life was like in the 1960s. But I actually do remember that era, and there were some good things about it. Um, as you can see, this is uh, Don Draper in uh, Mad Men, but people did dress like that. They smoked a lot. In fact, we used to think that was something that was sort of a cool thing to do. Uh, cars were actually arguably cooler in the 60s than they are today. <laughs> Um, and this was not uh, something that uh, people shunned and, uh, and sushi did not exist, at least in this country. Um, as a result of this, uh, this is what mortality looked like, cardiac deaths, uh, in the first half of the 19th century. It, year, every decade, year over year over year, the number of people dying from heart disease increased in this country. It was literally epidemic. In the 1960s, the American population was about 170 million. That's about half of what it is today, and about a million Americans died from heart disease, about 50% of the deaths. Today, uh, the population is about 300 million, and about uh, fewer than a million people die a year from heart disease, although it's fairly close to a million, down, a million in this country. It shows you that the uh, remarkable progress we've made over the last 50 years in treating coronary artery disease. How did we make the progress? turns out that investing in medical research, despite what you may hear on the news these days, was a good thing to do. And after World War II, this was recognized when, following World War II, Congress passed uh, a, a act to establish the National Heart Institute, which subsequently became the NHLBI. In 1948, they uh, began the Framingham study, which is following the population of Framingham, Massachusetts. And it wasn't until the early 60s, the same decade, that we uh, put a man on the moon that we actually recognized cholesterol was a risk factor. 
Uh, I think we suspected smoking was bad, but that identified smoking. The risk of hypertension was also identified in the Framingham study. And subsequently, over the uh, next few decades, we made remarkable progress, and this gives you a brief uh, a historical survey of the progress that was made. It was really the golden era of cardiology. And because of that, what you see on the bottom slide here is that there was an overall uh, mark reduction between uh, 1950 and um, 1995, and I'll show you the latest data. Uh, in cardiovascular mortality, this is the red line here, is uh, heart disease, this is stroke, remarkable progress in stroke, and this is all other diseases over the same 50-year period. And that was attributable largely to that Framingham study. Again, I want to point out that that was a long-term co uh, long cohort study. It was not a randomized uh, uh, clinical trial and uh, had remarkable impact. Uh, the reduction in mortality was basically half attributable to risk factor modification and half attributable to uh, new technologies and medical therapies. And the progress has continued. What I didn't show you in the last slide was that over the first 50 years, there was effectively no decrease in, um, in cardiovascular mortality for women. That has come in the last decade. Um, what you see is men in blue. I'm sorry, here we go. Males in blue here in terms of mortality from 1980 to 2010. And you can see a nice decline. But women were pretty flat over that until about 2000. What happened in 2000, a public awareness campaign. My good friend and ex-office mate, Betsy Nabel, when she was the director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood, did a lot to promote women's heart disease, which we hear about the Go Red for Women was promoted by the American Heart Association. In a controversial deal, uh, which was actually still controversial, Betsy made a deal with Diet Coke to promote women and heart disease. And while I don't know if that was a good or a bad thing to do, and I don't want to weigh in, I will say that public awareness of heart disease has been brought to the forefront in the last 10 years. And I suspect that much of this progress in combating heart disease in women was because of these sort of public awareness initiatives. However, cardiovascular disease remains the number one cause of death on a worldwide basis. There's more deaths from cardiovascular disease than all forms of cancer combined. <clears throat> We're increasingly concerned about the cost of health care. If you look at uh, the cost of cardiovascular disease, that's $324 billion a year. And that's just Medicare expenditures. That's not the total cost in this country. Remarkably, and I was surprised by that, that's three times more in this country, and this data is from 2010, that Medicare spends on all forms of cancer is spent on heart disease. So still a major national uh, health concern, and international. It's the leading cause of death worldwide basis now. Moreover, there's some storm clouds on the horizon. We've all seen these sorts of statistics. Um, I just highlighted the fact that uh, MI and stroke remain the leading cause of death in the world, and the incidence will increase due to the ongoing ep obesity epidemic. I think I heard on the news, and I, I know the statistic is correct, this is the first generation, if we don't get ahead of this obesity thing, where people will live for shorter times than their parents in the United States. And it's projected that one out of three babies born in this country today will get, type, will get diabetes or type 2 diabetes sometime in their life if we don't get a hold of this. Again, but what has really characterized heart disease nowadays when I attend in the CCU is aging of the population. Uh, we, what we're seeing now are degenerative heart disease, heart valve disease, a senile, what we used to call senile calcific aortic stenosis, now we call it calcific aortic stenosis. Um, heart failure uh, at Penn, and any given day we have 50 to 60 patients in the hospital with heart failure. It's the most common diagnosis nationally, and it's the most common DRG in our patients at Penn. Atrial fibrillation, epidemic, one in 10 adults over age 70 uh, present with some form of atrial fibrillation. And as I highlighted in my case presentation, what used to be terminal diseases, and I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, due to remarkable advances in surgery, and I have to be, give credit to our neighbors at the south at Johns Hopkins, uh, basically the surgical advances there really move the field forward, and people are surviving with that. One scary statistic uh, that I want to highlight uh, in this talk, and I highlight to many audiences, is that despite 50 years of progress, um, 
are curves in terms of progress in national awareness for modification of risk factors uh, when you look at ideal heart health as defined by the American Heart Association, and that is, uh, the targets are actually listed here. There we go. Smoking, sorry. Smoking, physical activity, it's recommended that kids uh, uh, do 60 minutes of activity per day. Uh, obesity or uh, body mass index is in terms of ideal diet, dietary guidelines, cholesterol guidelines, blood pressure. There's a flattening off of this overall in terms of kids. We're not seeing progress like we saw over the last 50 years, suggesting that we're not likely to see improvement. And when you look at adults over age 20, you also see the same things in terms of idealized heart health, a flattening from about 2000 to 2010. And that gray bar here, somewhere here, is actually uh, fasting plasma glucose, re reflecting the remarkable rise in diabetes across the U.S. population, suggesting that we are at risk for standard coronary artery disease uh, in the decades ahead if we don't get ahead of this thing. This is represented here. This, this, these are, this is a map of the United States in 1990, and what you see in the center of this, you see the relative uh, incidence, uh, I'm sorry, prevalence of, of obesity defined as a BMI over 30 in 1990, that's 1998, and that's 2006. That's the United States, a really scary trend. How does that translate into diabetes? That's 1994 diabetes in this country in terms of the incidence, a lot of blue, a little bit of white. That's 2005. And as you can see, it selectively uh, affects some parts of the country. You look pretty healthy in Washington, actually, healthier than we are in Philadelphia, which, looking around the room, doesn't surprise me. You should see what it looks like in Philadelphia when I talk to audiences. <laughs> the cheesesteak is not all good. Okay. And this obesity epidemic, it's important to recognize this fact, that this isn't genetic, this is environmental. Until about 1980, this is in men, this is in women, and this is, this is the percent of the population with obesity, again defined as a BMI of, I believe this was, yeah, over 30. Um, you see a remarkable uptick in around 1988, and it's continued to increase to this day. So this sort of quick increase strongly suggests is that these are environmental factors and not genetic factors across a population, suggests that there are things we can do to modify this if we get ahead of it. But let me backtrack now and talk about what the patients I see in the CCU have, uh, why they're different than 50 years ago, and just highlight some of the areas. And the first is what I like to say that blue babies are growing up. We're seeing congenital heart disease in adults now increasingly. Um, as you may know, congenital heart disease is the most common cause of uh, infant death from birth defects. One in about 100 babies are born with congenital heart disease. Over a million Americans have been diagnosed with congenital heart disease. And about two babies per thousand uh, require invasive treatment or die under age one still to this day from congenital heart disease in the year 2000. Over 25,000 cardiovascular operations for congenital heart disease were performed on children. So that's a fairly common surgery. And from 1979 to 1997, age-adjusted death rates from congenital heart disease declined from uh, by 39%. And what I want to highlight here, this is the OR at Johns Hopkins, where they developed with Helen Blalek. Uh, she's not shown here, but um, Helen Tausick, I'm sorry. Vivian Tausick, who was the laboratory technician, who is generally shown in the back of the room telling everybody what to do. He actually worked out all these surgeries on his own. There's a great HBO documentary on Vivian Tom Thomas, who I encourage everybody to read. And this is actually Joe Perloff, who's one of my predecessors at Penn, was chief of cardiology at Penn. Joe is still alive and well. Now he's the Barbara Streisand professor at UCLA. Uh, and Joe is generally credited with establishing the field of adult congenital heart disease as more and more of these children uh, benefited from the surgical advances uh, over the uh, dec decade, prior decades. This just gives you some idea of uh, the survival according to decade you were born in, the 40s, the 60s, when you were born with complex congenital heart disease. In 1940, you had about 5% survival. That was up to 1960. 
about a 15%, only 1% of transpositions of the great arteries and 10% of TETs survived to adulthood. By 1970, it was up to 50%. And by 1980, it's up to 80%. We're now at around 90%. Uh, in the year 2010. So you can see why we're seeing more and more of these patients. But this was 50 years of medical progress, and to be fair, this was largely surgical progress. Medical therapies have a play a role. Increasingly in adult congenital heart disease, they play a role. But this was largely due to uh, really uh, groundbreaking surgical advances. This shows you the population of patients across the United States with complex heart disease. 1970, about 325,000 patients over the age of 21. 500,000 by 1980. 750, 1990. A million in the year 2000. And we're projected to have in the United States population 1.3 million by the year 2010. Okay, we, haven't, we don't have the latest statistics. About 20,000 new patients per year. And surprisingly, there are less than 100 uh, ACHD specialists in the United States. So you do the math if you're a cardiology fellow on where there's opportunity. Okay, now this is one of my favorite parts of the slide and especially like it. Let's see if we're going to get this thing to work. You guys know who this is? That's right. That's right. It's Sean White. Sean White was born November, I'm sorry, uh, September 1986. He was born with Tetralogy of Fallot. 1987, he had a surgical repair of his Tetralogy of Fallot. That shows you the type of life people are leading from this disease that had a 5% survival only 40 years ago. It's amazing. Uh, it blows me away that that's the case. But what about aging of the U.S. population? This just shows you the incidence of cardiovascular disease by decade and shows the remarkable increase with age. And as you note, in particular, the incidence is remarkably high in 70, 80, and 90-year-old people. What do, what's the most common? Well, this just shows you, uh, actually, this, this was surprised me as well. If you look at this, people over 85. What's the most common cause of death? It's not cancer, it's not Alzheimer, it's cardiovascular disease, far and away. Uh, that was actually something that I didn't realize until I started to look into this a little bit more uh, as, I, um, as I attended and started seeing more and more diff difficult patients, 80 and 90 year olds, where we're facing them with different forms of degenerative heart disease uh, that we now face in the CCU. This just shows you that heart failure is the most common diagnosis of hospitalized patients in the United States. It's leveled off a little bit, but it far and away exceeds all other uh, diagnoses for DRGs uh, for Medicare patients in the United States. And this just shows you that the majority of patients that present with heart failure are actually people over age 65. Um, and if you look at the first episode of heart failure, it's the most common in people over age 75. So clearly a disease associated with aging of the population. And it's not surprising that at Penn, our heart failure service, we have about anywhere between 40 and 60 patients. We actually have two heart failure teams rounding at any given day. Our CCU service, which is a lot of acute coronary disease and, um, and other and odds and ends like congenital heart disease, Fortunately, that's the one I attend on. We have less than 20 patients on any given day in the uh, CCU. So, so again, it shows you that heart failure is just dominating here. Um, and again, this shows you prevalence of heart failure by age, highlighting the fact that it's, despite genetic forms of cardiomyopathy, it's relatively uncommon in young people. But as the population ages, uh, the uh, prevalence of heart failure increases uh, with aging. This has led to new considerations um, in terms of uh, challenges we face in medicine. And this reflects some of the new um, uh, pressures, good things, I think, that have been highlighted uh, by health economics and uh, public policy in the United States. In that 30-day readmission rates for heart failure nationally stands at about 24 percent, but the range varies from 10 to 50 percent. And it's said that up to 75% of the readmissions are preventable, leading our hospital, and I'm sure your hospital, to focus on ways to prevent 
uh, cardiac readmissions. And increasingly, there are working groups across the country who are uh, really facing these sorts of problems, trying to improve the quality of life for patients with heart failure and keep those patients out of the hospital. Of note, elderly patients with heart failure are at an increased risk for early hospitalization with rates ranging from about 30% to about 50%. Effective strategies require a team, um, and it requires thinking about the lifetime of the disease, not just the episode of care. And it's been shown that the most important period is the transition phase from the hospital to the home, uh, where medical management, comprehensive discharge planning, uh, VNA coordination, visiting nurse coordination, and increasingly we recognize the value of uh, a short-term follow-up within seven to ten days, markedly reducing uh, readmissions. At our institution, we've gone from a readmission rate of about 25 percent to about 15 percent. We seem to be leveling off at that 15 percent uh, by instituting a program of uh, focusing on transitions from hospital to home. There is other phases in this that become important. I want to highlight the last phase. Unfortunately, heart failure is still a very morbid disease with a 50% five-year mortality. Um, and just like any other disease, at some point uh, it becomes relatively futile uh, to try and um, treat patients any further. And we have increasingly gone to palliative care discussions with our patients when they've reached uh, end-stage heart failure. But as I highlighted, heart failure is still a, has a 50% five-year mortality. And I wanted to just say that the future is pretty bright, I think. Uh, again, in the 70s, uh, nationally, heart transplants uh, sort of took off, but they've been leveling off. Uh, I know you do about uh, 20 or 30 a year. We do about 60 a year at Penn now. But we've seen no increase over that period. There's limited, and you know, you're basically replacing one disease for another. Uh, bioengineering offers some promise with biomechanical pumps, LVADs, BIVADs, uh, all sorts of things. I just saw that uh, they actually approved the, um, the pulmonary artery implantable device yesterday for a select group of patients in the United States. We'll see how that works. But I believe that the greatest promise is regenerative medicine, and I wanted to just highlight that the University of Washington is remarkably fortunate to be leaders in this area. This is uh, Michael Laflamme. I'm sorry, let me go back to them. Uh, go back. There we are. And Chuck Murray, who I'm meeting with later today. Um, and this was uh, taken from their article that they published just uh, earlier this year in Nature, showing the ability to uh, transplant uh, cells. Uh, in this case, I believe they were taking human cells and uh, ES cells and uh, differentiating them into cardiac myocytes and implanting that in a non-human primate heart. And just remarkably exciting time, although as um, I believe that this, th this group is really emblematic of the best of this field, uh, they're working through the basic principles to develop this technology. But I think the future is remarkably bright, and I would say the University of Washington is leading the way in that regard. Okay, another problem, diseases of aging, uh, calcific aortic stenosis. Um, as I said earlier in my uh, talk, we used to call this senile, that's no longer PC, um, uh, or degenerative aortic stenosis. It's the most common cause of aortic stenosis in the adult population. In adults over age 65, aortic sclerosis, I'm not saying stenosis, defined as irregular thickening of the aortic valve leaflets without significant obstruction is observed in up to about 30% uh, of echocardiograms. Calcific aortic stenosis, that is with obstruction, uh, without obstruction, I'm sorry, um, is associated, at, uh, well, let me highlight the fact that in and of itself, calcific aortic stenosis without obstruction is associated with a 50% increased risk of cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction. It generally correlates with, uh, with uh, coexisting uh, coronary artery and uh, vascular uh, calcification and other disease. Calcific aortic stenosis affects about 2% of the population above age 65, and risk factors for uh, calcific aortic stenosis uh, are really those for, um, and we actually heard a really nice talk by one of the fellows about this, trying to identify other risk factors, uh, but they're the same risk factors as we see for uh, hypertension, although uh, we, are, we really do not have uh, ways to accurately predict which, uh, which patients go on and develop obstructive 
uh, calcific aortic stenosis, end-stage disease, critical aortic stenosis from those that don't, and we're looking uh, actively for biomarkers and, more importantly, way pathways involved so we can start to block that. Um, and as I mentioned, calcific aortic stenosis has been linked to inflammatory markers and components of the metabolic syndrome. This slide, which is a very old slide, shows you that um, aortic stenosis, plain and simply, is not medically treated. It doesn't do well. It has a exorbitantly high mortality as you look at this uh, survival curve versus surgical treatment, and these are patients uh, treated with uh, prosthetic aortic valves. Medically treated patients, uh, about 80% of the patients die within two years of the onset of symptoms, highlighting just how uh, devastating critical aortic stenosis is. And surgically treated patients with aortic valve uh, about have an 85% uh, five-year survival. So remarkable advances surgically, again, a surgical disease. But here's the rub. With more and more of the patients being in the elderly population and having comorbid conditions, 30 to 50 percent of patients over age 80 are deemed inoperable. And that means, in effect, that you are, um, that those patients are sub subject to about a 80 um, percent to your mortality if you don't operate. So really grim statistic. That has led at our institution and others across the country to new uh, technologies, uh, including transcutaneous heart valve replacement. We do about 200 of these a year now. Um, and what you'll see here, and I want to just orient the uh, medical audience to this, this is just a still frame. I'll, I'll show the video in a second. Uh, from a, uh, a TAVR procedure, what you see here that if you got to use your imagination sort of is a slinky-like advice. That's the valve struts. This is the prosthetic valve opened up in the metallic part of the valve struts. That's shown here, which is being placed over this <coughs> wire. This is a flex wire. This is a pacer that we use to control the heart rhythm during this procedure. Um, and, um, and let me just play this here and show you how this works. This is, and it's a team, and I want to highlight we do this in partnership in a hybrid OR with our uh, surgeons and our interventional cardiologists. It really takes a team to do this. Um, and what you'll see here is they're positioning the valve across the aortic valve here until it's in position. You also note that the heart starts to go really quickly. They need to pace it very quickly like that to, to uh, reduce the motion artifact. And then what you'll see, this is my favorite part of the video, is everyone holds their breath. They say it's in the right place. They blow up the balloon and sooner or later they blow up the balloon. You've got to pace the heart fast. There we go. That's the balloon blowing up. They take the balloon down, I hope. And you're left with a valve sitting in the aortic valve procedure. This is a transformational procedure. It's approved for uh, inoperable patients and high-risk patients in the United States. Um, I will, will say that other valve uh, techniques are being developed, but this one far and away, uh, I would say, is way ahead of where we are with mitral valve replacements. But uh, truly transformative, these patients, who many of whom are in, in fact, uh, at our pen, over half of them are over age 80, uh, are home within a week, uh, oftentimes within several days from uh, this procedure. So truly an exciting era, something that we never even dreamed about. Uh, when I was training cardiology, uh, open heart surgery without opening the chest at all. Again, this was uh, the slide from last year. We did about we were up to about 600 of these things. Uh, really transformational. Um, that was the easy part of the procedure. This was the hard part. Um, it's trying to get a heart surgeon to work together with an interventional cardiologist, especially our heart surgeon and our interventional cardiologist. The, learning the procedure took a little time. Getting these two guys to work together, not easy. Um, but we are seeing that increasingly. Uh, merging disciplines. Uh, the CT, we now, and I hear you do too, we have integrated clinics where the heart surgeons, vascular surgeons, cardiologists work together in, in our practice at the uh, Center for Advanced Medicine, our, our aptly named Center for Advanced Medicine. It's really teamwork. And increasingly, I think what we're going to see is merging of the professional identities across subspecialties, and cardiology is one of the fields that we're seeing that in, that, that uh, merging going on in a very rapid pace. What about other diseases associated with aging? We all know friends. I have friends, certainly, that present with atrial fibrillation at a very young age. 
but it turns out that atrial fibrillation, uh, the prevalence of AFib, increases with aging. Uh, 2.8 million Americans have been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. It's about 1% of the U.S. population. 70% of patients with atrial fibrillation are between 65 and 75 years old. Approximately 1 in 10 patient, uh, people over the age of 70 have been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, and depending upon specific risk factors, the risk of stroke for AFib is up to ninefold greater than in the general population. Um, and again, that's really the uh, complication that we're most concerned about is the risk of stroke. Um, and there is the good data that therapy with drugs to control heart rate and heart rhythm are effective in this. Uh, but equally important is the need in some, but not all, patients for anticoagulation. This is the question that I'm frequently asked in clinic, what's my risk of having stroke with atrial fibrillation? I mentioned that we use a CHADS-2 score, and the risk of stroke goes up proportionately with CHADS-2 score. Um, and that includes just simple questions, yes or no. Does the patient have heart failure? Here we, here we go. Hypertension, are they over age 75? Do they have diabetes? And have they had a prior stroke? And you can see the number of points assigned and you can see here the annual chance of having a stroke. So it goes from about 2% here. If you have a CHAD score of zero, that is the answer to all these questions are no, to about a, up, up to a 20% here if the answer to most of these questions is yes. And for that reason, these are the recommendations uh, that we recommend for patients if we, are looking, are, if we use CHAD score to determine who should be anticoagulated. Uh, zero or one, we use aspirin. One, well, one is sort of, it's your choice, but anything above two, Coumadin or Dabigatran now are recommended for these patients, Dabigatran in patients without valvular heart disease. Okay. Again, those are uh, sobering numbers and sobering statistics, but we believe that the future here may, live, uh, may reside in new approaches. I mentioned that we do uh, at Penn, uh, and again, what you see here, this is one of my, another one of my predecessors. We got a lot of them. We got Fran Wood, we got Joe Perloff, and this is Mark Josephson somewhere here. There's Mark. Uh, Mark was the chief of cardiology at Penn in the 1980s into the early 90s. Mark is generally considered one of the uh, fathers of the field of cardiac electrophysiology. This is his first fellow somewhere here, Frank Marslinski, who runs our EP program. They both were a lot younger there. Mark is very gray now. Frank is a little bit gray now. Um, but in any case, um, these two guys have uh, been pioneers in uh, electrophysiology and Frank in developing uh, catheter-based treatments to treat um, uh, atrial fibrillation. This shows you uh, how patients uh, who are medically refractory are treated at Penn and the number of procedures that we perform. And this goes to about 2012. These are uh, approaches, again, for the uh, medical residents. It turns out that the, um, that the initiating foci of atrial fibrillation in many patients, in fact, in most patients, are in the pulmonary veins. And the procedures that we perform at Penn, called pulmonary, sorry, pulmonary vein isolation, largely uh, involves isolating the pulmonary veins from the rest of the myocardium by a series of catheter ablations that's shown here. Here we go, somewhere. All right, there we go. In this NOGA map, they actually, these are the pulmonary veins. This is a 3T, 3D reconstruction, and they actually create each one of these little dark red dots are lesions that they create to isolate the pulmonary veins. And you can see the success rate that we've shown at Penn in a variety of age groups from less than 45 to over 65. This um, is percent AF control. This is at one year. Uh, we see about an 80% success rate, and patients can be brought back for that. It's not ideal. It's not for every patient. Uh, complications do occur, uh, though the rate is relatively low. But we think that going forward, this will increasingly be the approach to patients. Uh, that being said, I think we all agree that uh, medical therapy is, uh, should be initiated first and in those patients that either for lifestyle reasons or other reasons uh, are not doing well are referred for AFib ablation. And we're only seeing increases uh, over time uh, when, again, when I attend in the CCU. But what about the future? How should we be practicing medicine? Well, you see here. Uh, and again, this probably doesn't look familiar to those who uh, saw the old hospital, the University Hospital. This is our new Center for Advanced Medicine here. 
This wing of it is our outpatient heart and vascular center, uh, which is again, as I mentioned, our integrated practices with a variety of specialists. What's really exciting about this, this is the SMILO Center for Translational Research. Uh, my laboratory is on the 11th floor of this building. We can actually walk from this wing of this building. It sort of looks like a bunch of Legos, actually, but you can go, the architecture, you can go through this big glass lobby over to the Heart and Vascular Center, and uh, what we've been doing is taking advantage of that co-location to really uh, leverage our patients. We see about, uh, in this outpatient center, about 60,000 outpatient cardiology visits per year, and all those patients are asked to enroll in a large biobank. We've got about 50,000 patients enrolled in our biorepository right now. And this initiative, which was largely led by Dan Rader and Tom Coppola, uh, we have uh, 10,000 consecutive patients that underwent cardiac catheterization. Uh, this was several years ago. We had 4,000 heart failure patients enrolled. We're up to about 8,000 now. Um, and we have a collection of over 700 explanted hearts. We follow uh, over 1,000 patients with heart transplants now at HUP. Uh, we, all the patients, not all the patients, uh, but we have a unified database that integrates the genetic, genomic, and imaging data with the electronic medical record. So we can quantify things like that, a DNA bank and tissue bank. Um, as I mentioned, the most challenging part of this was the integration of the database to handle this information. And to be fair, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> and through this initiative, uh, a number of things came forward. We were able, through GWAS studies, um, to identify novel tar genes that are involved in a variety of diseases, including genes associated with premature myocardial infarction, diabetes, abdominal aortic aneurysms, um, heart failure and congenital heart disease. Um, this for our faculty has been a boon. Um, it led to many, many, many manuscripts uh, in many different journals, many of them high impact. This is just one association uh, showing genome-wide association studies for coronary artery disease, which came, which really highlights the ability to leverage um, our clinical patients uh, for medical discovery and in return to understand and personalize therapeutics. I know the University of Washington is nationally renowned for the genetics and genomics that takes place here and historically has taken place here. Uh, we are undertaking similar initiatives and I think the era of the whole genome sequencing is upon us and within five years I'd predict that most of, uh, of our patients will actually undergo um, whole genome sequencing to really understand this at a new level. This highlights what we actually have in place and some of the people that participate in this. Uh, what I think is the true future of cardiology, which I would call preventive cardiology. We've seen a lot of technology. We've seen many, many new drugs impacting. But clearly what is needed is to reduce heart disease before it begins. We believe with whole genome sequencing, and we haven't done whole genome, we've done exome sequencing. Uh, this is the type of database that we've created for our patients. Uh, specifically, uh, this is uh, looking at candidate genes that have been associated either by GWAS or other mechanisms with disease. And these are our do de doctors in our preventive cardiology center. This is Dan Rader, who's known for his work on cholesterol and other diseases. Tom Coppola, who heads up our heart failure team. Emil de Gama, who again is our, uh, the anchor clinician in our uh, program. And Anjali Owens, who heads up our uh, genetics of cardiomyopathy program. So let me uh, conclude with a few uh, what I hope are obvious conclusions. Cardiovascular disease remains a global issue and is the leading cause of death in the world. The prevalence of cardiovascular disease will continue to increase as the population ages. Uh, increases in cardiovascular disease will be exacerbated uh, in a truly uh, scary way by the worldwide epidemic of obesity and diabetes if we don't get ahead of this. Uh, of note, for the first time, that seems to be leveling off, if not decreasing in this country, the latest statistics show. So we may be breaking through there, although it's way too soon to declare victory there. New discovery paradigms must be adopted to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease, and I think integrating genetics into imaging uh, and, uh, whole, and electronic health records uh, will be the future and will lead to new targets 
therapeutic targets and uh, new pathways that may be involved in disease uh, that we can either leverage to prevent or treat disease as they emerge. Emergence uh, of, I think that the way we've defined the cardio cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, and in fact other disciplines will continue to evolve over time uh, as uh, more and more therapies require teams instead of individuals. Personalized medicine, a uh, very commonly used term, uh, precision medicine is the other term we use, uh, is largely a theory now, but I think will become a reality and, and will lead to new and exciting uh, effective preventive strategies. And we must not lose sight as a country, uh, given the dollars we spend on health care, that compar comparative effectiveness and health economics will guide future advances and need to be considered in these decisions. And I will stop there and answer questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Put the old school up there. Sure. You talked, about, you talked about personalized medicine, and then the line under it was, you know, co relative cost effectiveness. And to some extent, aren't those at odds, like, you know, population-based risk management that you treat, you know, everybody, you know, with a low-cost, effective treatment and try and, you know, treat the whole population versus personalized medicine, which uses expensive approaches to do genetic analysis of complex, and then you're... You're having to customize it for each patient, which is expensive. So how are those two going to work? Yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely why I put those next to each other, uh, because your point is very, very well taken. I think that the, the, the burden of proof is upon us to prove that they, um, that they are effective, that they're cost effective. We, we have ways to measure this. I, I'm most impressed, actually, as I'm sure the case is here as it is at Penn, that most of the personalized or precision medicine initiative has been in the field of cancer. Um, in select cancers, particularly melanoma patients, there are specific mutations in BRAF that predict uh, certain categories of drugs that will be effective. And you can show cost benefit of quality of year life saved there. For the, what I'm referring to now in, in cardiovascular, I think the jury is out. I think that being said, part of our problem is our past success in cardiovascular. I actually sort of laugh about this because we do do personalized medicine. If a patient comes in and their cholesterol is elevated above our guidelines, we treat those patients. We don't put every patient on a statin. And that is personalized medicine. To some extent, that's what the cancer people are trying to do when they identify a defective pathway, admittedly um, uh, with a disease that may have a, um, a more profound short-term consequence. So your point's well taken. Just sequencing people to sequence people, let alone the fact that we don't know what to do with the data, uh, is, is something that we as a so society have to get our hands around. And I would not advocate doing whole gen genome sequencing across populations at this point in time because we just don't know what to do with the data. Nor can we afford to do it, although the cost of sequencing, as you well know here, uh, is coming down precipitously. $1,000 genome is upon us. Almost. Next question, any other question? Yes, Chuck. I, I have a question just about the um, public perception of cardiovascular disease and the burden that it places. And I'm struck as I go and do public outreach or try to do fundraising or, or whatever and, and talk about cardiovascular disease, the burden of heart failure and so forth. How many people have the attitude, well, you got to die of something, and this is not a bad way to go. It's a disease of the elderly, and, you know, maybe we shouldn't be thinking so much about heart disease. Maybe we should be thinking about other kinds of, other kinds of problems. And it, it, it isn't like it was in the, in the 60s when it was sort of public enemy number one, that sort of thing. Right. Have you run into that kind of perception, and, and, and what, what would your response be to something like that? So first of all, your perception is real, though I would say that I, I, I see that in many, many different ways. But I, I think there's an easy argument to that. We're not looking for how to extend life. We're looking to improve the quality of life. And so as people age, what you need to target is to reduce the morbidity of disease rather than extend life. And I think that that's something people have to recognize. Um, you know, living with heart failure is not 
for many people, it's a struggle from day to day. And if we develop new therapies or ways to prevent heart failure, that's a quality life year saved. And I think that that's the answer. Now, to your point, and I do this myself, I'm amazed at how easy it is to raise money for cancer. I mean, I, I've, I can't tell you, now that I'm chair of medicine, uh, I, I go to the meetings with our fundraising people, and boy, every week we run in there, there's two more endowed chairs for somebody doing cancer research. It has a psych, psychological pull than nothing else, and I, I can tell you, but cardiovascular disease, and I actually highlight the stuff that Betsy did when she was the head of the NHLBI with a public awareness campaign for women. I mean, the statistics for women in heart disease are really scary. I think what came out on the news last weekend and, and was highlighted uh, that most of our drugs have not been tested in women cohorts. We don't know the benefit in women. Those are points well taken. Um, we, we need, as a society, to get our hands around there. So there's really great opportunities. But your point's correct. Um, part of it also um, to take was that people feel recognized that there has been remarkable progress in heart disease. But when you start talking about statistics, like one American still dies every 30 seconds from heart disease, um, and I can go on and give you all the statistics, a million Americans are dying from heart disease, that's three times more than cancer. Um, you know, you can get people's attention by bringing them back to reality because the war is far from over, uh, but the perception, as you allude to it, out there, is that, that, you know, we've done what we can for heart disease, uh, let's move on to other exciting targets. Well, one concern that I've had, you know, when you look at nature biotechnology and you look at uh, emerging patents and things that are coming to, for, to fruition, the, the sparsity of new pharmacologics for cardiology is, right. is, is scary. Yep. Um, whereas the amount of mechanical devices seem to be exploding, and I'm, I'm concerned about the, in terms of cardiology, uh, it just doesn't seem like a lot of big pharmas are interested so much, and, and especially since Penn has a good right. bio... Uh, right. uh, bioengineering program, or not right. a small molecule program. Yeah. I was wondering if you had any thoughts. Yeah, no, no, your points are well taken. Um, again, I think we are a victim of our own success. Um, I think that as we all know, uh, and, I, and, and you know, pharma is there to increase shareholder value. Um, I hate to put those terms. You would hope it's for humanitarian reasons. I think their, their taglines are all humanitarian. But at the end of the day, they go, you know, Sutton's Law, they go where the dollars are. And the problem is we have, if you want to develop a new heart failure drug, it has to be effective on top of the three classes of drugs that every patient should be on, and you have to prove incremental benefit on top of that. That's a high bar, and if there's any side effect, it's game over. Cancer, different story. Um, I mean, there is an acute need for it. There are fewer drugs out there that are affected. Solid tumors, it's remarkably few. Uh, side effects are tolerated because of the risk-benefit profile. Um, that's, why, that's why they're going there. I think one thing I'd like to correct is um, actually one of my close friends is a geneticist, David Ginsburg at University of Michigan. And David said to me many years ago, sometimes engineering beats biology. And I think cardiology were a victim of that. I, you know, and again, uh, to just to be, you know, wear my cardiology hat, I know there's a lot of, well, there have been several high impact papers showing that we can make artificial biological pacemakers in a variety of animal models. I'm sure we could actually do it in people right now. Um, that being said, pacemakers are 99.9% .9 efficient. It's going to be hard to beat that biologically. And as we go to leadless pacemakers, which we now are implanting very commonly at Penn, that's a tough, that's a tough bar to beat uh, with biology. And I think that regenerative approaches to end-stage heart failure, absolutely necessary. We, um, we, uh, surprisingly, the, the total artificial heart, which actually I showed that picture, that was our first total artificial heart patient at Penn. It's not ideal. Uh, we're still struggling with that. that. You know, will we develop hybrid devices with biological linings? Maybe. Um, as I said, I put the this, this slide of the people here because I think this approach this group is using um, is exactly the way we should be approaching the problem. It's still a big problem, but you've got to pick your targets. I think, uh, to your point, you're right. Um, many, many of the big pharma companies have dropped their cardiovascular programs. That being said, now wearing my medicine hat, because I've done this for all of a month, um, you know, they've stopped making antibiotics and anti-TB drugs as well. Um, and that's, in terms of a global threat, perhaps more of a concern uh, 
uh, because there was no money to be made in those fields as well. And I think, uh, you know, and again, I mean, in Gates, Gates' hometown here, uh, some of the stuff he's doing on a global basis to, to, to raise the national attention to those areas and opportunities is very, very, very important. So you're, it's not just about improving shareholder value, it's about improving human health on a global basis. Yes. Uh, question. Can you show uh, the successes of your personalized uh, medicine program in the cardiovascular industry? And you listed a number of different polymorphisms that have been linked to various diseases, and there's a whole host of others that have come up in cardiovascular medicine. But they really haven't impacted the way we practice in medicine as a sort of general, at least yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there are a number of sort of high profile sort of failures where they try to be used guided therapy. And I'm just wondering, maybe I my misperception, but um, do you think that's something specific to cardiovascular disease? Do you think it's we're, we're behind cancer? What, what do you think is, is I think we need to be patient. Um, and let me highlight where Brown and Goldstein started off with Mendelian familial hypercholesterolemia, which would have popped out in a GWAS study and LDL receptor still does pop out. That we've had the easy, big impact. The the major uh, loci have been identified, and we have drugs for those loci. I think that your your point. First of all, there's an issue in terms of GWAS studies, and GWAS studies need to be validated in multiple populations. Let's just take that out of play. But assuming that there is invalidated GWAS studies, if you look at the impact of any given loci on disease, you're less than 5% for most cardiovascular targets. That may or may not represent a real opportunity because if you can highlight the pathways there, you might be able to identify new classes of drugs. But to your point, and to my earlier point, we have had 50 years of success developing drugs in major pathways, most of it neurohumoral activation or, or blocking agents. Um, I will tell you that um, I do think that we will identify new targets through the identif identification of GWAS targets, but your point is very, very well taken. Um, I think we have to, it's been publicly criticized for good reason. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.